Welcome everybody. We've got Yamei Cassio here today, who is a futurist. And he's been with the Institute for the Future uh, for 13 years as a distinguished fellow um, and has written uh, copious amounts of articles on how to think about the future. He's got a blog at Open the Future. Um, and we met in San Francisco at a conference that I helped organize, a Humanity Plus conference in 2012. So well, welcome back on the show, Yamei. It's good to have you here. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me on again. Absolutely, yes. Well, um, I was reading a, like an article uh, of, by the Pew Research called The Future of Truth and Misinformation Online. Um, and I noticed a very thought-provoking quote and said, and it was a quote by you and say, hey, I know this guy. What, what are you doing here sort of thing? And uh, it'll, I'll, I'll just read the quote because I think it really will frame the interview quite well. Um, the power and diversity of very low cost technologies allowing unsophisticated users to create believable alternative facts is increasing rapidly. It's important to note that the goal of these tools is not necessarily to create consistent and believable alternative facts, but, and this is the important part, to create plausible levels of doubt in actual facts. And so the crisis we face about truth and reliable facts is predicated less on the ability to get people to believe the wrong thing as it is on the ability to get people to believe, to doubt the right thing. Um, and then, you know, you, you talk about the rise of Donald Trump and the success there. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, the pure research is like top notch research stuff. So it's, I mean, it's uh, quite a, uh, a number of feathers in your cap to have them quote you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, congratulations. Uh, so look, I guess, um, So I've been more and more concerned of late about the degree to which people have been fooled by or, or, or just go along anyway with um, alternative facts, fake news and disinformation. Do you want to give your view on what's going on here and why it's happening? Um, the internet is a powerful thing. I've been online and you could say arguably on the internet since, um, since the days you had to do something called bang pathing for email. Because it was it was before the the era of SMTP. If you wanted to send an email to somebody, you actually had to designate which computers along the way it would hop hop from, and you'd use an exclamation point, a bang, um, to to indicate which computers would be next. You had to bang path your email. So that was way back in the eighties. So I've been on. I, I'm an old man, um, in many ways, and uh, one of the things that those of us who were early on the internet and started to think of it as something bigger than just, you know, a large scale BBS or something like that, um, was recognizing that one of the important qualities, probably the critical quality of the internet as a social phenomenon, is its ability to connect disparate marginalized communities. Mm. That is, if you, if you were growing up gay, for example, in, you know, Central Australia or in the Midwest in the United States or in Poland, you could feel really isolated. Even if there were a few other gay people in town, you probably didn't know them because you were afraid, you know, justifiably afraid. You know, and I'm thinking here, especially back in the 80s and 90s. But when you could connect with other people like you, even if you were on the other side of the planet, you suddenly began to get a sense of community. You could, you could actually begin to identify yourself in a way that you never could before because you have this, this capacity to connect. And so what the internet enabled was an ability for people who were in marginalized, even oppressed groups to connect with each other, to become empowered by connection. And that sounds great. And it is, you know, without a doubt has been wonderful for various marginalized uh, communities, especially LGBTQ communities. But we forgot that there is kind of a cost to that and that not every marginalized group is a good group. Hmm. So among the various types of people who got to find like-minded others were um, white supremacists and neo-Nazis and the like. Uh, basically nationalist populists around the world. Uh, 
mm. found that their what they felt were were marginalized opinions, and I'd say justifiably marginalized opinions. Mm. Other people held them as well, and they could connect and create communities. Mm. And so you have this world emerging where the bulk of the people taking advantage of this this ability, this capacity to connect, were people who were in groups that really could use it and do good things with it, create strong identity communities around the world that will allow them to express our identities at home. But there were also people who saw this as a way to gain power for points of view that had been, that we have generally dismissed as being unacceptable. Mm. And so along with that, there was, you know, to, to a significant degree, and there still is, uh, an online cohort of disaffected young men. The kind of people that in the past uh, terrorist groups would recruit, uh, religious groups would recruit, armies would recruit, because there's something about being a, a young man in teens and 20s without any sense of connection, um, filled with anger and testosterone, mm -hmm. who wants to find somebody to hit. And there are a lot of people like that. They, they often are pretty misogynist. Uh, they're often pretty racist. And so, you ever heard of a guy named Steve Bannon? Yep. If you were following the, the emergence of Donald Trump in 2015, 2016, mm -hmm. there, he had this- um, He created Bright uh, News, right? This mentor. Yeah, he, he created uh, Breitbart and a number, a few other of the alt-right, but he also was one of the people behind um, the whole Gamergate movement. One of the people who helped to, to the, basically, if you remember from about five or six years ago, there was a group of people who, of uh, young men who decided that a woman was getting too much attention for her game and she must have slept with the reviewer who didn't actually review her game. Um, and basically her ex-boyfriend was putting out a lot of crap, uh, untruths about her. But this sort of snowballed into this massive thing of attacks on any, you basically you have, you have two, two genders, male and political. You know, that, that whole line of thinking that there's this world where unless you are a straight, uh, a straight cis white guy in his teens or 20s, you you are political. You are doing something that is that attacks. They attacked gamers was that, that whole thing. So um, Steve Bannon was one of the engines of of propagating that. He was one of the engines of, pro of promulgating uh, propagating uh, Donald Trump. And so you had the you had the emergence of groups that saw the power of the internet in in connecting oppressed and and marginalized groups as well as giving voice to this generation, this cohort that needs an outlet. And so you had this flowering around the world of uh, what has become known as the alt-right, mm. but has uh, really taken on a nationalist and populist level that connects nicely with a lot of the people, you know, a lot of what, what older people have been thinking, you know, opinions that they aren't allowed to express anymore because they're bad. Well, yeah, they're bad. Um, but now they, here's, here's a group of people that they can, they can connect with. So you have this thing happening online that's independent of Facebook, independent of Twitter, independent of MySpace, and, and, but took advantage of those various platforms, took advantage of YouTube, and took advantage of the algorithms in these systems to um, SEO. to gain eyeballs, to, to get oh, yeah. pe more people to watch. And so you had this system of self-reinforcement of ideas. Okay, so you have all of this going on. Along with the emergence of tools of information manipulation, particularly around images and eventually video. You may, you may remember that way back, like, 15, 20 years ago, I was writing about something that I called the participatory panopticon. Yeah, I've got a question about that later. Yeah. Oh, good, good. So the participatory panopticon is Great. usually Great. referred Great. to as surveillance. Oh, thank you. It's fun to say. 
Um, but it's usually referred to as surveillance today, you know, watching from below. Please so surveillance is watching from above, violence. surveillance is watching. From, and so whether that's people with their cell phones taking pictures or taking videos of, of cops doing bad things or, you know, people sneaking a, a camera into a, um, a meatpacking factory to show the horrible abuses, et cetera, et cetera. That's surveillance. I called it a participatory panopticon. Hmm. Well, in discussion with some friends about 15 years ago, uh, I, you know, what happens when people start using these same communication technologies, but manipulated? And I called it the participatory Decepticon <laughs> because I'm a geek and I, yeah, I, I, I amuse myself in that way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Basically. But you know, so that didn't really take off. But but this is something I've been chewing on for a while. So what happens when you have these tools, these um, ways of creating reality, these these methodologies and technologies of creating reality that become extraordinarily simple, that become something that anybody could use hmm. and anybody could share, and so. We are you know, Trump emerged, and you know a lot of these movements emerged just at that that nexus point, where these the technologies have become viable, the networks had become sufficiently ubiquitous, and the political power was shifting in a way that there were people who wanted to to grab back what they had lost when in the United States when a black man became president. That was that was a trigger for a lot of a lot of the right wing people here. Um, so here in the U.S., that had this an enormous um, impact of people deciding that reality or what they what they believe about the world would, could be justifiably based on what they what they believed about reality and what their opinions were, rather than having to face facts. Even better, they could often find examples of the the false facts that would support what they have to say, and people who weren't involved in either in either end of that fight over reality would just look at this and say, "Well, these guys have been right in the past, but these guys have an awfully persuasive YouTube video. You know, who knows what reality is? You know, I'm I'm going to be I'm going to protect my kids, and you have some people who say that vaccines are bad, so." I'll just not not vaccinate them because they may be right. I don't know. Mm. Or you have people who say, I don't know what rea what's happening in the world, but this Trump guy is awfully funny. Or Boris Johnson's a hoot. Or all of these different movements that would speak to not their intellect, but their, um, well, their anger or they're just in more broadly their emotion. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's just, we are in this yeah, incredible nexus, an incredible combination point. Hmm. The tribal affiliation becomes easily expressed because you can, you can create that tribe so quickly and so thoroughly with this, these various social tools enabled by the power of a ubiquitous internet. So all of these things coming together at once, you know, creating a world where it's just, we're, people are already overwhelmed. I mean, folks like you, you and me, we spend our time, you and I, we spend our time um, thinking about technology and politics and what's going on in the world. Most folks don't have the, the wherewithal or the bandwidth to deal with that. Hmm. Um, you know, they have kids they need, need to pick up from school. They have, you know, mortgages they need to pay. They have, you know, work they need to do, long commutes, and it just gets to a point where they don't want to have to deal with this crap. Yeah, we've only got it's, limited it, headspace. Let, a goal this big and a biological yeah. computer. <laughs> it's not very, like, we're exactly. not unlimited, unbounded rational agents. We don't have the power to sort of process and make sense of everything. Um, the economists like to exactly. treat us like rational agents sometimes. And <laughs> I reckon it's just an excuse. There is a, uh, there's a, I don't know if it's a math or a physics joke, um, but it, in parallel to economists like to treat everyone as ra rational agents, you ask a, um, a physicist to explain something about a pasture and they say well assume a spherical cow and it's that same kind of you make these these um abstractions and rationalizations to make it easier to think mm -hmm. um 
That's very cool. But chicken. sometimes I, I remember. people take advantage of that. Yeah, Feynman, Richard Feynman um, sort of abstracted things through the idea of having a, like beginning with a spherical chicken and then getting them to describe and abstract away from that to, to uh, you know, start from a basic, the very simplest form possible. And then right. And that form may not match reality, but it, make, it makes it easier to argue. Mm. And so this is the world that we live in right now. Mm -hmm. And it's a world where well, something like, grab this, you know, this little, this little black and red slab that I have mm -hmm. can Good. be, an, yeah, exactly. You know, these are, um, right now. I, I refer to this as my pocket brain. Yeah. Um, Outsourcing. And, uh, you know, exactly. It's a, it's an exocortical augmentation. <laughs> if you want to get really fancy with the language. Um, but think of the amazing things you can do with it. I mean, it's a cliche to talk about, well, that's more powerful than anything in the Apollo program to put people on the moon. No, yeah, fine, that, whatever. Mm. But it is more powerful than any of the computers used to make Tron or Jurassic Park. Mm. Um, and you think about Jurassic I mean, Park. Jurassic was Park was a cluster of computers. It was Wolfpack uh, back uh, in the day. Of, uh, you know, Silicon Graphics, uh, yeah, Silicon Graphics, uh, Unix machines, basically, yeah. and you know this one little iPhone outclasses all of them. It's probably equivalent to a fairly significant cluster of computers at the time. Yeah, sure. Right. And you know that's a three-year-old iPhone. Uh, the point being that we have this enormous ability, and we have people who like to show off. Being so, you have the, you know so you have these tools being turned into things for amusement. Hmm. So I don't know if, how much you hang around on YouTube, but I mean, just sort of poking and watching videos, I mean, not being a a, the creative type that you are. Channel. You're a creator and not a consumer. So, so, but one thing that I've seen pop up a lot lately are deep fakes mm -hmm. of dead politicians singing songs. Yeah. So here's Stalin and Hitler singing Video Killed the Radio Star. It's ludicrous. It's absolutely ludicrous. This is not an attempt to fool anyone. It's just an attempt to amuse people. And we're seeing a lot more of these technologies of deception used to amuse people right now. But that doesn't eliminate the pot their potential as tools for deeper and more meaningful deceptions. Absolutely. So that's where we stand. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the present. GPT-3 is certainly um, a, a force to be reckoned with. I mean, not just that. Oh, I mean, yeah. Look, we have other text modeling or um, language modeling software out there, software. Uh, but this is all based on deep learning, right? Um, and mm -hmm. look, it's really hard to understand the models that they do generate. Um, but it's also making it, 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 it very difficult to understand. If... if, if these models are being used um, in competition with the truth to develop, to help sort of automate creating fake news in believable ways. Yeah, the, these are the sorts of tools are getting more refined and more sharp and more, I guess, convincing um, to, yeah, AI might be able to sort of be used to help uh, create believable alternative facts out there. And GTP3 right. is one of them, right? Darwin is a harsh mistress. I mean, these kinds of evolutionary co comp competitive models, um, you know, antagonistic you know, models are, you know, fantastic for creating things that work startlingly well. You know, they sometimes come up with really ludicrous and um, unintentionally hilarious uh, efforts. Yeah. But more often than not, and increasingly often, they're coming up with stuff that is... Um, sufficiently good as to be be believably from a human author or mm. human creator. Mm. And so that then goes back to the, okay, here you have these competing, you know, alternate, alternate realities. Which one do you accept as real? Mm. Then you have to step back to what is the, um, the paradigm? What is the understanding of the world? that you're going in, that you use when you start to encounter these things, which takes us back to um, issue, uh, efforts to try to teach uh, critical thinking. Yep. 
you know, and the the fact that that is political. Hmm. You know, you probably have heard that a few years ago, the uh, the the Texas Board of Education tried to include critical thinking as one of the uh, topics they wanted to cover in high, for high school students, and the Texas Republican Party fought that and had it removed. Oh wow, I didn't know that. That's crazy. Yeah. Well. Critical thinking is the same as questioning things. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you start questioning things, well, then you may, may start changing your mind about the Bible or about how great America is or all of these things that, you know, particular political points of view want to just ram down the, you know, the brains of young people. So while critical thinking shouldn't be political, it has become so. And we will see a similar pathway for other kinds of, I mean, think about what happened with fact checking over the past year, yep. past year or two, yeah, where I mean, just the very more. reference to a fact checking site la would label you a, a, a liberal or label you as having a particular political having orientation, just because you wanted to point to a fact checker. Mm. It's, it's crazy. I was having to discuss And it's the world we live in. Exactly. Yeah, I was having this discussion with um, a couple of conservative, a few conservative friends of mine, and I've noticed a, a bit of a, a pattern. Um, and that they, they, I asked them all, okay, uh, they don't like some fact checkers like Snopes or um, others. And, and I asked always, well, is there any that you do like? And they say, oh, no, they're all pretty much liberally biased. And so I don't, you know, I don't, I used to like them, but now I don't anymore sort of thing. Um, and then I say, well, I got the most mileage out of just trying to go through with them what a, a good fact checker would look like or how it would operate in abstract rather than just trying to sort of bite them on mm -hmm. trying to make them believe that these fact checkers are good, that the existing ones anyway. Um, so, yeah, it's just trying to nut out like what it is what's missing in fact checkers what get them to actually articulate what they don't like about them it's, it, it's a it's a struggle right i i have found that it is sometimes useful at the very least amusing when someone offers up something like you know they, a really strong belief in someone like trump or someone who is to any rational thinker expressing nonsense you ask them well what would it take for this for you not to believe this person? What would that person have to do for you to say, hey, wait a minute, that's not right? And because sometimes it makes them start thinking about, well, you know, I, my, my knee-jerk reaction was to say this, but then I realized this person has already gone past that line and makes them start to think. Other times it makes them double down and commit to being essentially a cultist. And so I think what we're going to be seeing in, over the next decade is the emergence of um, techniques or organizations or, I don't know, individuals who have a, something to sell as a way uh, trying to get in there and deprogram these political cultists. Mm. And is your, is your mom caught up in QAnon? Well, let us, we'll, we'll kidnap her and take her away for a week and she'll come back a, a normal person. Hmm. You know, that, that kind of thing. You don't, I don't know if you're old enough to remember all of the cult deprogrammers that were running around in the, the, the 80s. Um, but uh, there, was an, there was a period where cults were something that everybody worried about, like quicksand. You know, it, you grew up seeing quicksand everywhere in cartoons. Like, they must be something we have to worry about as an adult. Well, similarly, we hear people talk about cults all the time. Must be something to worry about, and therefore there's something to sell. There are a lot of cult programmers, people who go and kidnap, usually young people, and take them away and basically enact um, torture without physical harm, but with the kinds of tortures that would still be prohibited by the Geneva Convention to get them to break and break out of the belief in this cult. Hmm. The degree to which it worked is a subject of controversy. Yeah. Um, it's undoubted that some, some people benefited from it. It's very likely that more people were harmed by it, but, hmm. but that's the kind of thing, the situation we're moving into, that kind of environment where you look at some, something like the QAnon phenomenon, 
and you think these people are crazy. I mean, these people are, are like deluded at a fundamental way. How do you break them out of that? And eventually you start looking for, you know, a stick to smack them upside the head because they just can't break away from this, this, um, not even a conspiracy theory. Again, conspiracy theory takes it too seriously. This um, fantasy world mm -hmm. that makes sense to them mm -hmm. because the world that we live in is chaotic and complex and is not something that has to abide by a narrative. And so you have people who look at this and are just overwhelmed by the the state of nature, the state of the world, that there's just so much crap going on. How could this be happening? Here is a theory. Here is a mindset that explains it in a way that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Aha, there's this cabal of ca uh, cannibal liberals who are who are trying to drink the adenochrone from from children, and they are they have this you know the the lizard people with the queen of England might be involved, but, uh, you know, but there's, a, you know, there's this idea that there are these powerful forces, powerful dark forces behind the scenes that are making horrible things happen. And we have a hero that we can identify as someone who was pushing back because, and we know that they're the hero that can push back because all of these dark forces are making all sorts of public um, expressions of disgust and dismay about this guy. In this case, QAnon and Trump. So the more that you push back, the more that you fight against QAnon or Trump, the more the believers say, aha, we must be right. Mm. And so you have this, this amazing situation where you have all of these technologies of um, deception and communication of deception. You have an increasingly complex world uh, with you know, especially in 2020, a whole lot of crap happening that is just out of our control, mm. and you have these emerging narrative forces to that try to create meaning out of this reality, which is and can and can share along with it can share and spread along the lines of these tech, technological networks. Right. It's an it's his historians. If we survive, historians will look back at this era with amazement that it all came together at the same time. Um, but an analogy, hmm. historical analogy. If you look back at the period of time between, say, 1890 to 1920, a, you know, a 30 year chunk of time, single generation. Look at the kind of technologies that were developed. Look at the you know, around communication, around mobility. You had everything from the automobile to the airplane being developed in this time in this time period. Radio became super popular in this time period. You had the the emergence of new medical practices in this time period, and you still were still stuck with these the seventeenth and eighteenth century political model that inevitably led us into World War One. So you and and alongside that you had the great influenza hitting, hmm. and so you have a, it was another period of chaos in history, and so that tells us a couple of things. It could get worse, but we can get through it. Right. We managed to get through what happened a little over a hundred years ago. Hmm. We managed to get Just through a couple of world a, wars later. Yeah. A couple of world war, yeah. It, I'm not saying it was fun, <laughs> but we're still here. And that should give give you a little bit of hope. I guess so. I get, but um, what what frightens me too is the fact that we've got a lot more um, powerful weapons today. Uh, we got like mm -hmm. totalizing in the way that they sort of destroy the enemy or destroy on both sides of a of a conflict. I mean, we have of course right. we've, we've got automated warfare as well, where that gets mm -hmm. that gets scary when you have algorithms competing against each other in on the theater of war. Uh, and you know what's less, particularly less scary to me? I, I, you mentioning automated warfare. One of the things that Western armies in particular do is they drill into their soldiers and in particular their officers the requirement to obey the law and to 
um, resist an unlawful order. I mean, this is actually a big part of military training in the United States. You know, soldiers are trained that if you are given an unlawful order, it is your responsibility to refuse to t- carry out that order. Yeah, that's to interesting say no. you're bringing this up now because, I mean, just in the news recently, I've heard a lot about unlawful orders or whatever they were that influenced people to participate in the My Lai massacre in Vietnam War. So Exactly. So it just, well, participate, you know. And yet, there, and the person, there were people who pushed back against it, who defended the villagers. And, and the fact that the military punished a guy who defended the villagers was one of the reasons that this big cultural shift happened in the 1970s around the need to obey and the need to refuse an unlawful order. Okay, so with that as the, as the background, how does an automated military system refuse an unlawful order? It doesn't you tell it, it doesn't mean, it has it, it, you, you tell your automated rifles to shoot shoot the targets in this area and yes they that may include women and children or school children or whatever you know, innocent civilians and a human soldier would at the very least try to discriminate who they were shooting like, shooting at and more likely would say i can't do that this this is not a, a legal uh, combat environment a robot, an, a, a mechanized military, an automated military system can't make that distinct, can't distinguish that, can't say no. That's right. And until, until we have machines that can say no, it is them... foolish, dangerous, and likely criminal to introduce automated military systems right Human that's my out of the loop automated military systems we've, we've got like in the loop on the loop and out of the loop and i guess you understand the, the difference in those terms right the, i'd right. like to make a distinction here is like we have incredibly powerful artificial intelligence at the moment they're very good at correlating across mass data sets and they're very good at making predictions um and if you if you're smart enough um and you can un- like make sense of all the possible questions before you're developing the AI, you may be able to develop a model like a Bayesian net or something like that um, with the right expert elicitation uh, built in to counter all the possible um, nuances in the real world, which is pretty difficult, right? So AI is right. very good at correlating, not... predicting, but it's not very good at understanding or um, making sense of causation or um, answering or distinguishing why things happen, right? Why? And that's in, and that's because it doesn't have access to the, the full range of information, and it's programmed by humans. Okay. Well, they so do, you have they this AI, even if even if it's a learning, even if it's a learning system, the the parameters upon which it, the learning system is based. The, the underlying rules to how it learns things, you know, what, how it assigns levels of reliability to various facts, those initially come from humans. Mm-hmm. And, we'll, and we have plenty of real world examples of how they embed human values. Um, there is a really simple example of a, um, there is a word, I believe it's in Turkish, that can mean both uh, doctor and nurse. And when you translate, uh, he is a, whatever this word is, into English via Google Translate, it says he is a doctor. If you translate, she is a, this exact same word in Google Translate, she is a nurse. Hmm. Okay, And, and why? Well, it, Nobody at Google told it that particular translation. It picked it up via its, you know, its learning system, however it learns. In context, in, in linguistics. Uh, how to translate language. And through context through how, how people tend to use the language, whatever the, the rationale is. But there was nothing in the system that said, hang on, wait a second. We need to sanity check this this translation to make sure we're not embedding uh, embedding values, uh, but you're. But I think you're right in saying that there there may be a mechanisms that we could introduce that could go part of the way. So there is something I, I that came out a couple of years ago. 
Sure. There's a couple. There's a couple of people. Yeah. Um, Joshua Benigo is very big in the on the deep learning scene, and also uh, Judea Pearl. Definitely worth checking out what they've said about causative AI and the mileage that that might bring to having AI be able to answer why questions. Um, and this could mm -hmm. be very important because we have, if we have an AI that can do some sort of semblance of of understanding in the way that we intuit we do, then it may be able to. If if we give it an order. Um, and we're not very wise about that order, for instance, like if we're Midas and we just ask everything to turn that we touch to turn to gold, we'll have a computer that can say, are you sure you want to do that? Because don't you touch what you eat and aren't your relatives made of stuff that you don't want to turn into gold? So yeah, I mean, it makes sense right. to have a, like a computer that can push back against us, um, c giving why unwise commands, right? Or misinterpreting mm -hmm. commands. Absolutely. To be able to, or to you know, refuse illegal commands. Um, yes. There are these interesting border cases. So a few years ago, a, um, a rifle targeting system was developed that would essentially allow an untrained uh, rifle, uh, untrained, shoot, untrained shooter to hit targets at a kilometer or two out. Because what it would do is you, you know, you're holding the, the weapon, you sight, you identify what you want to shoot at, and you squeeze the trigger, and in the various moving around of the, of the rifle, once the computer identifies, aha, it'll hit now, it'll then fire. So there may be a couple of seconds lag between squeezing the trigger mm. and shooting. Who decided to shoot? Was that a computer decision? Was that a human decision? You know, it's a combination thereof. And so, you know, is that a point of intervention where the same system that is identifying now it's time to shoot could also potentially identify that's not a legal target. Hmm. Yeah, so it, this is going to be a really, from a, a complete, completely jaded uh, cynical perspective, it, it can be really interesting as this stuff emerges. Yeah. For a lot of people, it's going to be really scary. Yeah, for instance. Yeah, and that's like, actually something that is, I really try to keep in mind when I do my futures work is how does this how does this stuff affect regular people, not people who are deeply immersed in the voodoo of technology or machine learning or the people who are you know deeply embedded within the world of uh, political narratives, but the people who are trying to live their lives. When we talk about these developments, what does it mean for them? What does it mean for people who are, are not part of our circle to encounter a system that can tell them what to say next, that can predict what they're going to say next, mm -hmm. that can um, choose, their, choose their music for them? And some of that sounds really convenient, but then, okay, I'm not hearing the songs that I used to hear that were kind of weird and off kilter because they're not part of the machine learning you know, playlist that, that has emerged from collating the choices made by millions of people. The, the point, all of this, the point being that those of us who are in this world need to be really thoughtful about how this affects people who don't have good ideas to why this is happening. We come back to the why question. Why does this happen? Why should I do this? Well, that applies to people who are just trying to live their lives as well. Why is this happening to me? And that brings us back to the conversation about people trying to understand reality and how easily deceived they can be because they're trying to figure things out. And if you can give them a good narrative, if you can give them a good explanation even if that explanation is ludicrous, mm. there will be people who will grab that and say, aha, now I understand. Mm. Now I understand is a potentially dangerous line or potentially powerful one. Excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, it, it's fascinating. Um, people will... I guess be attracted to sort of explanations that fit their narratives already. Um, and it's always mm -hmm. been a difficult thing, hasn't it? Like if people trying to like sort of figure out who to trust, who, who should I trust? Right. And, um, and uh, largely it's um, very much a function of like 
who is around them, who their peers are, and um, who is likely, you know, to to cause immediate um, damage to their, I guess, their, their their status in their their peer group or or the people that they care about. Um, and so, you it's know, also an element have... of who is like them. Mm. It's an element of not just you know, who's around them, but who is like them. People tend to trust people like them in like appearance, them. in who look like them, who live in a similar kind of socioeconomic mm -hmm. class Believe or caste. Um, well, yeah, important. so all of these reasons that, okay, I can see myself in that person. I find, I find myself trustworthy. I'm going to trust that person. Hmm. Yeah, so, go on. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, I found it, the fascinating article. What was it called? Um, oh, the one you wrote about uh, Vuker and... Um, Banny. And Banny. That's right. um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It'd be yeah, fantastic the age of chaos. About the history of VUCA and, and um, how uh, this new framework, Banny, has emerged to more de deal with complexity and chaos a little more mm -hmm. easy. But it's just, I mean, like, maybe it's not the sort of thing that the every, everyday person will just sort of pick up and just use. But in terms of, like, maybe more at an organizational, managerial level, it's probably very useful. Yeah. So what yeah, about so VUCA, VUCA, V-U-C-A, yeah. um, is an acronym for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And it came out in the late 1980s from the U.S. Army War College as a way of trying to um, give a framework for the war fighting environment. That you have, you're in an environment where conditions are volatile, outcomes are uncertain, uh, systems are complex, and message, messaging may be ambiguous. And so how do you grapple with that? And so this basically gave a name to a particular kind of environment that for a lot of people, having a, having a name, having a framework allows them to start thinking in a more structured way about how do I deal with, how do I deal with volatility? How do we deal with uncertainty? complexity, ambiguity, et cetera. I'm trying to figure out what are the mechanisms, what are the steps that we can take? That was in a military context, but as happens fairly frequently, a lot of the stuff from the military world gets picked up by business strategists. So does, as an example, scenario planning came out of the world of um, essentially on thermonuclear warfare by Her uh, Herman Kahn back in the 1960s, that kind of thinking, thinking the unthinkable, that, kind, that model of thinking emerged from the, war the world of military. So VUCA moved from the Army War College and the U.S. military more generally into business strategy, into business schools, uh, business consultants, business leaders who started to use this language because it actually did a decent job of describing the world of that was emerging of uh, the digital the digital reality, the uh, move to the shift to mobility, the kinds of technological developments we're seeing, as well as the social developments around gender, around race, uh, it, political shifts, etc. So the VUCA was actually a really powerful term for a lot of business consultants in the early part of the century. So I'm going to cough again. <coughs> Excuse me. But, sorry. But it did have its limitations. Um, well, of course. I mean, and any kind of framework like this is going to have some kind of limitations. The idea is that these, these frameworks, what they allow you to do is to think through your responses in a, again, in a structured way. The problem is that as the world continued to evolve, VUCA really seemed increasingly insufficient. You know, the, the, the joke that I've made in the past is, I eat VUCA for breakfast. This is the reality around us. You know, we're swimming in VUCA. And so in that situation, that language, that framing doesn't tell us anything especially useful. So I got to thinking, well, what really would be the language that describes today? So a few years back, I started working on this concept that became, eventually became BANI, B-A-N-I, uh, which stands for brittle, anxiety-inducing, nonlinear, and incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. So brittle systems that 
if systems or structures that appear strong may even be strong until they hit a particular sharing force, political or physical, and they shatter. Mm. So systems that we everyone thinks this works, this works really well, and then suddenly it doesn't. Mm. I mean, this is something actually people, a lot of people are talking about brittle systems right now. One thing that we have had as an example for the past few years is the role of political norms you know, non, uh, non-legislative rules, but basically rules that we all accept in, in driving politics in the United States. Um, we basically, you know, in the past, people, uh, presidents and senators and the like would all basically go along with these rules because that's what everybody does. That's how things work. And then one thing that was novel about Bannon and Trump was he realized those aren't, those aren't laws. There's nothing, there are no consequences built into the system. And so they could violate these norms and nobody could do anything about it. The system would shatter. And so that's what we saw. And that's what we have seen with brittle systems. They look strong. They look like they're effective. And when they break, they break hard. Hmm. Um, so next I had anxiety inducing. And this is, um, this is more of what I've picked up from, from looking at, uh, from, from reading what people, especially younger people are saying about the world, that it's not simply scary. It's actually, it makes you feel like there are no good options. You know, anxiety is that feeling of, I don't know what to do because every step I'm going to, I can take is a bad one. You know, it's, I don't know where to go because I just missed my last exit and it's a hundred miles to the next one. Right. You know, the, um, that feeling of powerlessness right. combined with a sense of consequence. Hmm. So whereas with, with brittle systems, they may be brittle because people discover that there isn't a consequence to breaking them. Inversely with anxiety inducing systems, part of that anxiety comes from feeling like there may be consequences, even if I didn't do anything wrong. You know, I can't, I can't do anything. I can't take a right step. I can't solve this because there's no solution. That anxiety inducing aspect of it, I think is something that's really characteristic of um, society and politics today. Nonlinearity is harkens back to chaos theory in chaos mathematics. Um, it is actually, you know, boils down to these are systems where um, that are highly contingent upon initial conditions that can evolve very differently based on very small differences. Um, so the one system, one system that we know like this, that everyone knows like this is weather and climate. You know, these are nonlinear systems where the inputs and the outputs are not proportional. Um, a small change can have massive results. Mm -hmm. A massive change can have can have little or no result, and it's because these systems are chaotic. And we see this time and again across the panoply of of issues that we're wrestling with, where the act we take and the results that we get don't match. It could be political. It could be economic. You know, often technological. And then incomprehensible, and, and that's a word that I, that I, I, some people have found really kind of almost insulting. Like, how, how dare you say that I could not comprehend what's happening? So incomprehensible in this, you know, means where the systems are really are too complex for, for easy comprehension, for easy understanding of how we get from here to there. And what we've been talking about for much of the, the last hour mm -hmm. is, is very much this, these kinds of learning, uh, machine learning systems, uh, generative adversarial systems and the like, mm -hmm. they often come up with solutions, answers, or actions that we can't quite figure out how they get from here to there. Mm -hmm. you know, the example right. I, I used in, in, in the essay, the, the piece that I use when I talk about this, is that you can talk to almost any programmer and they facing will tell you about a time. Chaos. It was called Facing Gate of Chaos, was it? 
Yes, facing the age of chaos. Yes, thank you. It's, it's on Medium. Um, and you'll have a link in the comments or in, in the description. Yeah, both. Um, you talk to a programmer and they will tell you about a time where they had some lines in a program that they couldn't fit. These lines didn't seem to do anything. They weren't connected to anything. They, but if they remove those lines, the program wouldn't compile. Put the lines back in, the program compiled fine. It was a kind of incomprehensibility that I think is characteristic of what we're seeing right now. It, and I will go, I will accept that yes, at some point these things may be comprehensible. But the point is that for us right now, for the world in which we live with the tools that we have at hand, with the mechanisms and practices that we have, these outcomes are not within our ability to readily or convincingly understand. So how do you respond to this? You know, if you accept this, this is this Banny framework. If this is a better way of describing reality, well, as we as I said a, a little while ago, the whole point of these kinds of frameworks like VUCA is to give us a way of articulating uh, our the, the methods of responding. Right, I say, okay, this is the framework for this, the structure of the world. How do we go through and deal with each of these kinds of, of issues? You know, brittleness, and their whole, there are, uh, there's a wealth of, of uh, research around resilience models mm -hmm. that emerged out of psychiatry, but has moved into material science in particular, and then more broadly into systems thinking, you know, resilience, you know, what are the mechanisms of resilience that would allow us to essentially weather the change of a, of a shattered system um, to, to bend, not break, mm -hmm. uh, to take to take a hit and keep going hmm. so it, there's all these resilience responses that people have been talking about and looking into uh, anxiety inducing well aside from maybe uh taking some drugs or something like that uh whether it's xanax or marijuana um the anxiety inducing well there there are behavioral methods that we that we have learned that help us to navigate anxiety Nonlinearity, there is not, not just a mathematical response, but the, basically the, the point is that when you have this, these complex, chaotic challenges, we need a new way of looking at the world, a new set of actions. We can't just do what we've been doing all along because those methods and, and responses have become increasingly irrelevant and ineffective. So that was the, the underlying point of the uh, Facing the Age of Chaos essay and the emergence of, of Banny. Like I said, I came up with it a couple of years ago, and it was almost as a thought exercise. It's like, okay, let me try to get a new framing of this. Put it out there. I am, much to my surprise, starting to see examples of people using the framework, the Banny framework. Oh, that's good. Especially in Europe as part of their um, business consulting practices, part of their systems theory practices, you know, academics. And so it's actually, I know that there's much more that needs to be done with it, but it has clearly struck a nerve. It has clearly articulated something that needed to be articulated, and it's a path that we need to follow. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll give us a better handle on wrestling with the chaos uh, that's around us, mm -hmm. um, the chaos of 2021, because if anyone thinks that 2020 was an anomaly, they're in for a surprise. It's so funny. I, I think of the word 2020 as like having 2020 vision, but it's been quite the opposite. I mean, <laughs> it, it could have been used yep. as a clarion call to foresight and um, clear thinking and the uh, yeah, the obfuscating all the issues, but it seems to have been exactly the opposite in so many ways. Right. Unfortunately, sorry to put it down on things. One of the things that's been no, 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 no. One of the things that's particularly fascinating about 2020, huh, among the many things, is that not everything that's happened was a direct consequence of what happened in the year before or the systems that we had at play. 
the pandemic hmm. could have arisen at any time. And think about how lucky we've been globally that the pandemic emerged now versus 30 years ago. I mean, can you imagine being 19, think about 1990 and just what technologies were available to us in 1990, what practices and um, economic, uh, economic tools were available to us in 1990 that, that would not be able to deal with, could not grapple with the, the impact of the pandemic. Mm. We, today, we have the remote systems, the ability to have these kinds of, of conversations mm. that have become easy and ubiquitous. Right. And that was not possible. Turn. People can work from home. People can have meetings online without actually having physical sort of, I, I, what, you, you can have right. discussions with people quite easily. You can see their face, um, teleconference, and you can like operate uh, from home. Yeah. Just, yeah. I was part of a, um, a scenario, uh, a scenario event uh, earlier in the month from that was run by Nagasaki University, looking at the intersection of pandemic and nuclear weapons. And there were participants from China, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, United States, hmm. and we're all working together. I, mean, I was running some of the small group uh, processes. And it worked, it worked very well. And we could not have done that. We couldn't have done that 15 or 20 years ago, let alone 30. And you couldn't, could not have done that with a first generation Android or, or iPhone. Couldn't do that. And I don't know if you remember the, the kinds of cameras that were available to plug into your computer in the 90s, hmm. uh, but they were, they were ridiculous. Um, the, the point being that- Right, were they analog cameras? There are, there are, there are sorry? Were they analog Repeat? cameras? I mean, the digital cameras, uh, I mean, there, there may have been a few digital cameras in the 90s, but like, I don't remember them being- There were some, so you want to look, you know the company Logitech? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, they make keyboards and mice. Well, actually they started off by making something called a quick cam, which was about the size of a, of a tennis ball that plugged into the serial port on your computer and gave you a 320 by 240 right. black and white. It kind of looked like that, kind of looked like that, except it was white and had a cable running from it and gave you a, a black and white, I think it, it gave you video of like 10 frames per second. Mm. Or, uh, yeah, not only that, or actually you're talking maybe one, now I'm thinking about about one or two frames per second. Mm. And it, but it was video on your computer that you were, that you had right there in front of you. And that was in the, the mid nineties. Hmm. Yeah, the point of all this is that there are exogenous factors that we have to wrestle with as well, not just the things that are crises of our own doing. Mm -hmm. We have we have to keep in mind that in this complexity, we have to be able to account for the things that we don't know are coming. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that has been a, a critical lesson for uh, emerging from the pandemic. In my, in my work with Institute for the Future, I've been busier over the last year than I was last, the, the few years previous. The pandemic has been a wake up call for organizations, businesses and governments around the world to say, holy crap, we have no idea how to deal with surprises. And it turns out there's a whole group of people who have made a profession, a, a discipline out of trying to understand surprises. And so, uh, there is a growing recognition that we need to have the ability to withstand the unexpected, mm -hmm. to be able to deal with the unexpected, uh, to be able to identify it in its earliest stages, to be able to compensate for it, and to be able to emerge from it. And we haven't been good at that. And one of the benefits down the road of this horrible, horrible pandemic may be an improvement in our ability to deal with unexpected crises, wherever they come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I, part of this is a uh, scenario planning, if you've had a lot to do with that, right? Um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you're, you're, 
One of the questions I did have is about deconstructionism, where, where you know, uh, you know, po postmodernism, and I've got a question here, somewhere here. I forgot how I framed it. Oh yeah, so if you've spoken about using narratives to help understand possible futures, right? And I'm not sure mm -hmm. if there's really um, like a tight, tightly coupled relationship between this and deconstructionism. This sort of philosophical approach to trying to make sense of the world um, mm -hmm. and yeah I just want to know what your thoughts are on deconstructionism and postmodernism and um, you know and relative truths <laughs> and people's idea that uh, this is my truth and that's your truth over there and like we can't really have this sort of mutual ground anymore in which we can sort of independently or, or collaboratively ad adjudicate between you know fal falsehoods and truthhoods or likelihood estimates so yeah it makes it really hard if we don't have this sort of common ground to to sort of stand right on. If, if right the truth is relevant. a shared reality yeah and that's going to get and then that will only get worse as we have these you know wonderful new uh augmented or enhanced reality systems that allow us to change what the world looks like around us or whatever um to answer the, the first part about the connections between foresight thinking and future thinking and you know scenario planning and, and the like and deconstructionism and postmodernism superficial at best um the you know, scenario planning future thinking largely came out of the world of the military in in through business world and while there ha there are academic studies of uh, foresight thinking the university of hawaii has a particularly good program uh it uh, it is largely centered around uh, for university of hawaii it's political science it's, it's an emerging form of political of political science for the university of houston in texas it's part of the business school so there is too little appreciation for philosophy hmm. in the world of foresight thinking I don't want to embarrass myself, so I'm not going to try to pontificate on nuances of deconstructionism and postmodernism because I don't think my understanding is sufficient to um, do more than sound smart. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I can say lots of things that sound smart, but I want to be actually have a better understanding before I try to articulate something like that. Um, but what you said about uh, about common common ground or shared realities, one thing that makes that so difficult is incomplete. <clears throat> one thing that make <coughs> sorry. sorry, one thing that makes that so difficult is incomplete knowledge of each other's experiences. Um, I had a conversation with somebody who was trying to argue for a you know an overwhelmingly objective reality that if you drop a bowling ball on your foot it's gonna hurt mm. well what if i'm wearing steel-toed boots mm. and that's it, that may seem like a silly response but what the, what the set is saying is my reality may not match your assumptions about my reality and so we have to be very careful when we articulate a common ground or a shared reality that what we are describing is actually a shared reality and not simply our interpretation of reality which we are there we are ascribing as being universal mm -hmm. um you know in a world of where you know science is all about being you know less wrong mm -hmm. you know to use a horrible Great expression it's, it's all about making you know making <laughs> better and better mistakes um mm -hmm. it is you know, not about uh, not about describing a universal truth. It's about being, you know, not quite as off as you were before, hmm. and that it's evolving. And that's one of the things that a lot of people who come from a religious background or come from a um, uh, an ideologically uh, nationalist background, you know, basically people who have very firm traditionalist beliefs find very difficult to deal with with science. You know, science is always changing. Well, yeah, that's what it does. You know, so you have people who complain about the science, what, you know, what I read in my science book 20 years ago isn't what they say now. 
Well, yes, it's not a, it's not a forever universal truth. It's an improved understanding of reality. So when we talk about a shared reality or common ground, we need to be really conscious of the fact that we are trying to figure out where our subjective beliefs about and understandings of the world overlap. Not trying to describe an, a uh, universal objective truth. And, that, and that's not me, me being philosophical or being a social justice warrior or whatever. It's me simply trying to articulate, we live in, you know, we live in different heads. You know, we have different bodies of knowledge and yet we need to act. You know, there's an old line from the people who do scenario planning, you know, the future is uncertain, uh, the future is uncertain, and yet we must act. Mm -hmm. Well, our shared knowledge is uncertain, and yet we must act. I mean, we, we have to do things knowing that we can't have perfect understanding of each other. Mm -hmm. So we try, to we try to develop tools, That's we try to develop technologies, methodologies, philosophies that, that help us navigate the the distance between our understandings of the world. Hmm. Well, talk about like a okay. So if we to scenario plan the future of um, better adjudicating likelihood of truth, <laughs> what will it look like? Well, like we spoke about fact checkers before. Um, how are people going hmm? to? Do you think? Uh, I guess be more capable of adjudicating truth and uh, I guess, you know, being, even if, it's, even if it's outside their sort of, you know, the boundaries of their clan, right? How are people mm -hmm. going to be persuaded um, to honestly uh, look, look at, like, find the truth about reality? Um, it's, it just seems like a wicked problem. Oh, it is. It is. If I, if I had a good answer for that, I would be so rich right now. <laughs> Um, you know, the, how are people going? I don't know. And that is actually one of these <laughs> anxiety inducing problems that we're facing is that we know that, it, that we're in a dangerous situation and there isn't a clear pathway out of it. We can say, well, we'll have these wonderful AI systems that can tell us the truth that can adjudicate reality for us. And in many cases that might work great. Um, until it make until one of these systems makes a a blunder that clearly comes from programming, you know the you know the um, face recognition cameras that can't recognize black faces, you know kind of thing, where the programming just didn't include an entire part of the world or entire so line of thinking. White people. Hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And so. We, we may trust these systems until they show us that they can't be trusted. And when they show us that it's a brittle system, that, that trust shatters. Mm. Um, and because AI is ultimately, you know, at its root, a human system, even the most advanced learning systems are still currently emerging from human, you know, human designs. The, you know, the reality is that these systems are going to have failure points. Mm. That may change. That probably will change, mm. you know, in the, in the years to come. Well, that's right. That One thing sense. that I've learned, I'm, I'm in my, I'm in my mid fifties now, and I've been playing this, this futures game for a long time. Um, and uh, there is a, a line that gets, you know, variously ascribed to Bill Gates and a few other folks. Um, I think it's originally from Roy Amara. Uh, that we tend to overestimate change in the near term and underestimate change in the long term. Yep. What I have found is that pe people in our line of work tend to over overestimate change in the long term too. Yeah, one, I've, I've been carrying, I've been assembling the last 20 years of the scenarios that I've written just because as a collection, because there are people, some people are interested. And it is fascinating, a little embarrassing and kind of funny to look at the scenarios that I wrote in 2007 uh, that talk about technologies because of the enormous advances that I anticipated, that I forecast would be happening by now, mm. you know, by 15 years later. 
Um, and we're, you know, things that we're nowhere close to. And I underestimated, and this is a recurring problem for a lot of people really? in, this, in this discipline. I underestimated the level of social change. Yeah. And that's actually something that we need to be, you know, people who do foresight work, who are futurists, who like to consider themselves students of tomorrow. Mm. Um, we need to be very conscious of the level of, that change is driven by by developments in our society and culture more so than developments in our tools. Because even when we make changes to our technologies and tools, it's how we adapt to those new tools, new devices, the kinds of things we we figure out as a way to make money, commit crime, get laid, you know, do whatever as a something that is a human to human interaction that comes from this device, not simply the device itself. What are the the nor the beliefs and norms that go into the design of something? What gets left out? Why does it get left out? And we once again come back to the why question. Uh, so if I'm designing a new phone, what do you know what do i want to include well what do i decide is not important to include anymore you know i had i don't need a headphone jack anymore right because we have all these wonderful wireless you know, wireless earplugs mm. well is that really the right decision from a social perspective not simply from the we need to make the phone skinnier make the phone thinner so I encourage people who are in this field who want to be part of the world of foresight, you know, world, uh, world of futurism, to pay as much attention to what's happening in our society and culture as you do to what's happening in our science and technology. Mm -hmm. Because the big changes that are happening inevitably come from the massive social forces underway, changing our identities, our beliefs, and how we see the world. Mm -hmm. And my voice is giving out, so I think I need to call it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's been fantastic um, having you again on the show. And yeah, I understand it's been quite chaotic in America. Um, it's, I mean, all over the world, really, but especially America, given the political upheavals and the response to the pandemic. So I, I do hope you, you're, you're doing well. Um, and I am. I am. Um, it's been a, a, a challenging year, but I don't have anyone, no one close to me has gotten sick with COVID. So that's, that's good. Hmm. Um, I, I'm, I can continue to work from home. I've been working from home for years anyway. Fantastic. And my wife who works at the UC Berkeley and the, the library system can work from home. So we're getting by hmm. and our, our cats are as playful and helpful, <laughs> helpful playful and healthy as they, they always have been and uh, muses, right? um, yes helpful in in a broad in the broad context of cats are never really helpful but <laughs> they're they're cute and that goes a long way hmm. uh, but thank you for inviting me to be part of the conversation I, I I look forward to seeing what magic you do with this yeah, well, and, I'm just going to upload um, it to, to YouTube. What I'll do is I'll um, put in your uh, blog details. I'll put the uh, the links to some of your, like the article that we spoke about. Um, what was it? The mm -hmm. uh, Facing the Age of Chaos. And also the Pew Research article, The Future of Truth and Misinformation yeah. Online. I think they're, they're, they're both amazing. Now, um, I'll put your... I'll put in a link to IFTF. Yeah, and the link. I'm putting the link to IFTF because I, actually, there's the, there's some folks at IFTF who's been who've been doing just an outstanding job of diving deep into misinformation and disinformation and right. and tech, the technologies thereof. Is so that, there's some really good stuff there. With that, with that, at the risk of um, not being able to mention everybody, is there anybody who you'd sort of like to sort of mention would be good to follow on, on this particular uh, topic? Guy named. A uh, guy named Sam Woolley, W-O-O-L-E-Y, yep. uh, L or L-L. -L. Sam Woolley uh, was with IFTF, now does independent work, but uh, you can follow him on Twitter. He's he's really sharp. Yep. Um, but I'll, I'll send you the link to the IFTF group that, that focuses on this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, put in the link to the Facing the Age of Chaos. I don't do much blog blogging these days. You put in a link to my Twitter, 
Twitter. Yes. That's yep. where most most of my um, regular pontificating shows up. Mm -hmm. um, Fantastic. And so, and I put links, you know, links to videos and, you know, I had a couple pieces in the bulletin of the atomic scientists earlier in the year. And so that's where I put links to things. Yep. So. Fantastic. Well, it's been wonderful. Um, and thanks everybody for tuning in. And if you like this content, please subscribe and tell your friends. Um, we all like to, uh, yeah, get connected. So yeah, please do that. And, um, is there anything, is there any events or any conferences you're going to be speaking at soon that you want to uh, raise awareness of? Oh, um, nothing that is public. You know, unfortunately, the, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that IFTF and the, the people I work with have been getting a lot of business. It's, you know, it's client business and that's great for the companies, not so great for the, for the public, mm -hmm. uh, public presence, mm -hmm. but uh, I will definitely keep you in, keep you, uh, uh informed mm -hmm. as to what's going on but uh again thank you very much for having me as part of this and i look forward to our next conversation absolutely you may speak soon bye for now